And you know what's curious? I think we know that better when we hand out music to sight read. And the closer we get to the concert, we tend to forget about it because we have to polish those notes and rhythms and the fangs come out and come on. How many times do I have to tell you F sharp? And, and we sort of forget about the humanity. And, you know, what does that pendulum look like? What side of the world are we living on? So, you know, that's where even even myself, you know, the closer I get to a concert, it's like, OK, we been there. We've done that. I can't rehearse those two bars anymore. Let's go, folks. And is that the right approach? No. Is that SEL? No. But, you know, we all have to uh, we all have to navigate this in our own way. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the good fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you knew one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now for my next guest, Scott Edgar. Hi, Scott. Hi, how are you, Mark? I'm doing really well, Scott. Can you do me a favor before we get into the conversation? Can you introduce yourself for my listeners? Tell them who you are and what you do. Yeah, certainly, Mark. So I teach at Lake Forest College. It's a small liberal arts college just north of Chicago. Uh, We have about 1,600 students at the college. I am the band director there, and I also teach music education courses. Uh, Since uh, being here, I've really delved into the issue of social and emotional learning in music education. I'm the author of Music Education and Social and Emotional Learning, The Heart of Teaching Music. I am a Music for All educational consultant, and we've just launched our new video series, Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music, through them. Uh, Beyond that, I live uh, just a little bit north of where I teach uh, with my wife, Steph, and our son, Nathan. Excellent, Scott. So, you know, this social emotional learning piece is really important right now. And I really wanted to make sure that I got you on the show before we hit, we really hit the ground as far as the new year, whether it's going to be in person or hybrid or virtual. I think this piece is something that's really vital that we discuss now because it's such an important part of what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Scott, before we get into the SEL conversation, um, can you tell me about your origin story? Yeah. So I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. I was born there. Come fourth grade, you got to choose an instrument. And uh, my uh, great, great uncle was a trumpet player who was a gigging, uh, gigging musician in the Columbus area. And when jazz musicians would come to town, he would be first called to fill out the big band because they didn't travel with the entire big band. They filled it out the towns where they went to play. So he would be playing with the legends as they came into Columbus. And I got to know him a little bit when I was young. And when it came time to pick up uh, an instrument, I said, you know what? It's going to be like Uncle Joe. I'm going to play trumpet. And when I was looking at an instrument and saying, you know, what type of mouthpiece, he just looked at me and he said, Scott, if you can make a good sound out of a pea shooter, you make a good sound out of a pea shooter. And the rest was history. And I was a trumpet player from that point on. Um, From uh, there, uh, I played all throughout middle school and high school and band was the air that I breathed. It was the reason that I went to school. It was the reason that I got up in the morning and I knew in, in my bones on some level that come even eighth grade, that this is what I wanted to do the rest of my life. <clears throat> and I didn't know what it looked like, but I knew that I idolized my band director. And to the point that when it was time to make uh, a choice of where to go to college, I ended up going to Bowling Green State University to study with a trumpet professor. And you know where my band director went and who he studied with? The exact same place and person who I did. That was one of the main decision-making factors. So from there, uh, I was down in uh, Dayton, Ohio, where I had the distinct privilege of teaching uh, instrumental music at Carroll High School uh, for seven years. 
and I taught at seven feeder schools into Carroll. Uh, and at that point, I was getting my master's degree at University of Dayton. I had the honor of taking a course with Dr. Colleen Conway from University of Michigan. And, you know, she just had something special. She put something in the water. And after seven years, I knew that I was craving some kind of change, that my calling in music education was going to go beyond what I was seeing uh, in my day-to-day -day band directing. Uh, so I went to University of Michigan to pursue my doctorate. From there, um, that's actually where I discovered social and emotional learning. A lot of times people say, Scott, did you do SEL when you were a band director? The answer is no, I had never even heard of the term. All I knew is that my kids had challenges and oftentimes I had no idea how to help them. So when I got to Michigan, <clears throat> that was kind of front and center. Because one, another point, both my parents are social workers. So as we're able to, you know, it was commonplace for us to talk about these things at the dinner table. <clears throat> so when I got to Michigan, it was like, what can I do? What can I discover? What can I learn to help our music teachers on how to help our students become more socially and self-aware while not being counselors? So from there, I um, head, uh, headed to the other side of the lake. Uh, and I'm now in Chicagoland, like I said, where I'm the band director at Lake Forest College. And I uh, teach music education. Right now, I'm chair of the Department of Music. And we are, uh, you know, as we start to get into the fall, I have to be honest with everybody, it feels like I'm a first year teacher again. Uh, I'm learning how to do everything uh, for the first time and just trying to figure out how to give the best experience to my students. So I want to ask, when you were in high school, when did you know that you were going to be going to the music profession? You, you know, I knew it was going to be something in the arts. And the first couple of years, my passion was actually more in theater. Uh, I didn't know what it was going to look like. I thought for some point I wanted to be a director or something like that. But there was something that clicked around junior year <clears throat> that I just said, you know, the theater thing, I don't know what that's going to look like. I have a model in front of me. I have a, someone who's been with me for the last seven years, and I've seen him day in and day out. I've gone to know his family, and I know how much he loves his job. And I said, you know what? Low-lying fruit. It's right there in front of me. So, you know, the arts were always something that I knew that I was drawn to. And I was very fortunate to have a uh, supportive family, have supportive uh, backing to say, you know what, you go into what you want that's going to make and bring joy to your life. And from that point, I just knew that that was going to be the path. Now, as with anything, there are times when you second guess. I mean, freshman year theory, when I had to take my first oral skills quiz, what am I doing? Are you serious? Abandon ship. First jury. What are we doing? <clears throat> but you work through those. And I, I firmly believe as we start to, you know, I know, Mark, we're going to talk a little bit about SEL coming down the road here. But resiliency and how do we prepare our students to be resilient? You know, music is all about resiliency. Music is all about how do we tackle the challenges and keep going. You know, no one has gone to a concert ever without overcoming a challenge and being resilient. So, you know, that's a life skill that I learned. But as we hit that junior year, it was really a downhill spiral, a, a wonderful downhill spiral of saying, this is your path. This is what you're going to do. So at that point, I started to take more lessons with different people, <clears throat> started to look at different colleges and university to figure out exactly where that was going to lead. And, you know, in the end, um, in the end, it was the person. In the end, it was the relationship. In the end, it was the motivation that was in front of my nose the entire time. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that band director. <clears throat> what did you learn from him that you took into your own teaching profession? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I'll put his name front and center. I'm going to only say good things about him here. Uh, but his name's Mike Renzi, uh, and he's at Bishop Watterson High School in Columbus, Ohio. And this was, um, you know, it's not an easy job. And he didn't always have the resources. He didn't always have everything that he needed. But he had the passion. And he had the vision to make it personal for his students. And what I remember is that when I came to the school in that morning, there was the one place that I went the first day. I went down to the band room. I put my trumpet in the locker and he was just in his office. Door was open. He had his coffee in his hand. And I just said, hi, Mr. Renzi. And he would say hi. Sometimes it would go deeper and sometimes it would be just that. We would part ways. We would see each other for seventh period when we had concert band, marching band after, jazz band after. And I just remember intense compassion. I remember intense passion. Um, and I remember him not letting us settle for mediocrity, but always remembering that there was a person that he was pushing and never going 
the other side of that line. And those were things that I think we would all say are noble, are honorable, and that are really stinking hard to do. And there are certainly times in my teaching career where I've fallen short of that goal. And I, I think we can all say the same, but those are definitely ideals that, um, that, that I think I've learned from Mr. Renzi. So tell me about after high school, you went to Bowling Green. Um, what was that like? What was your experience like there? Did you do the marching band, all that stuff? And then um, maybe we can go into your first job coming out of there and what you did after that. Yeah, certainly. So went to Bowling Green. Uh, and, and again, I was a music education major right out of the gates, declared day one. And I, I think one of the most profound memories I ever had was, you know, I had a little bit of anxiety going into moving away from home, moving into a dorm, what that looked like. And I moved in. And then the next thing that happened was I walked across the lawn from my dorm room to the College of Musical Arts building and went to my first marching band rehearsal. And that was the moment that I said, OK, I've arrived. This is where I'm meant to be. This is what is supposed to be happening. And as we're starting to look at what this looks like, it led to four wonderful years of learning about myself, learning about what I was good at, learning about my strengths, learning about my needs. You know, if we, you know, we'll link it to SEL again, I didn't know it then, but my self-awareness exploded during my four years at Bowling Green. I was constantly reminded about what I was good at and maybe more profoundly what I needed work on. Um, so from there, you know, I, I had four years of great experiences. Yeah, I did everything that I could do. And then from there, I had the opportunity um, to be heavily involved in Phi Mu Alpha and Kappa Kappa Psi and things that really gave me the opportunities to uh, develop friendships and relationships that came with me to this day. Uh, and one of those relationships actually resulted in my first step getting down to uh, my first job. So, you know, you graduate uh, and then you have the opportunity, you look at the job bulletin boards and you just throw all your materials out there. Well, one of the jobs that uh, popped up there was a school in Dayton, Ohio, that I had never heard of, that I said, okay, let's throw our hat into this ring. And about two weeks later, I got a call from the principal saying we would like to arrange an interview. Went down to Dayton, Ohio, uh, in a car that did not have air conditioning, drove around Dayton for about an hour just to kind of get to know the space. That's how I prepare for things. I want to know the society that the school was in. Uh, and I went in and I had an interview. I was dripping. I mean, my being out of that car, it was probably 100 degrees. And the second that I had an interview, there were two younger band directors in there with me and the principal. And the two younger band directors and the principal, we talked for about an hour. And when I left, I had the feeling that I didn't stand a chance. I didn't stand a chance to get this job. I thought that, you know, I, I had the skill set, but that was not a great interview. That was not anything that I thought was anything special. But two days later, I got a call from the principal and said, here you go. We'd like for you to come and join our team. And you know what? The rest was history. I was down there the next day to sign the contract. And seven years later, I discovered what it meant to be a band director. I discovered what it meant to build relationships with parents. I had some of the most supportive parents who to this day I stay in touch with. Um, you know, I never, I, I can honestly say though, my parent, the, the parent interactions that I've had throughout my entire career, they were all either the best experience or the worst experience. I never really lost sleep over interactions I had with kiddos. I lost sleep over parents' interactions. Um, but that taught me the most valuable lesson that we need to get parents on our side. And especially now, Mark, as we're starting to talk about the need to advocate for music education, mama bear and papa bear, my goodness, they need to be on our side. Uh, and a valuable lesson that I learned early on. And um, from that experience and working with kids and learning how to build a program, we were a small program. So, you know, there were some years that Flobo was a reality. Double reads, okay, maybe sometimes, yes, not a full compliment but you work with the kids who are in front of you and you recruit the heck. So through my experience at Carroll, I learned about the importance of recruiting. I learned about the importance of relationships. I learned about the importance of how to build a program, both musically and personally. Uh, and, and through all of those experiences, that, that's kind of the backdrop that really bases my musical philosophy, that it 
begins and ends with relationships. And yeah, I can have a perfect performance, but if the kids don't walk off that stage and my, my college kids, they're kids, they're, they're always kids to me, but if they don't walk off that stage, high-fiving and hugging and saying, wow, that was a moment. I don't really care. A musical moment without relationships and emotion is pretty empty for me. Yeah, there's a lot in there. We we should probably we're going to circle back to talking about parents because it's something that's on my mind um, right now. Um, but we should probably define our terms here a little bit, shouldn't we? Um, maybe let's talk about what is SEL and what are the the basic parameters or what are the basic ideas that we're dealing with here. Yeah, I could go on and talk for a couple hours on this one, uh, but 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 at its at its root, social and emotional learning is a set of skills that we can teach our students to achieve school and life success. And we can divide it into three really core categories of self. How can I develop self-awareness and self-management skills? How can I then apply that to getting along with others? How can I be socially aware and get along with others in relationship management? And then finally, the finish line of SEL is making good decisions. How can I teach my students to make responsible decisions? So there are a lot of times that people come and talk to me and say, uh, SEL, that feels a lot like counseling, or it feels a lot like everybody gets a hug. And those two things couldn't be farther from the truth. You know, our job is proactive mental health. Our job is to skill build ahead of challenges. Counselors, social workers, psychologists, we need them now more than ever, Mark, but their job is reactionary. Their job is to respond to trauma after it happens. Our job is proactive. We teach skills in music. We can teach skills for SEL. That's exactly the approach that we need to be taking here. Uh, it is my firm belief that for social and emotional learning to be effective, it needs to be embedded into content. It cannot be standalone. It cannot be something that is done during advisory. It's scripted. The kids are going to roll their eyes. You're going to resent it for having to do it. When it's embedded into content, embedded in our case into music, that's where the magic happens. That's where we can capitalize on the power of music the emotional elements of music, the social elements of music, so that we can really get at the heart. If it ever feels like we're doing music, 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 oh, stop, I got to do SEL now. Music, 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 we're doing it wrong. It should all be embedded into the way that we're teaching. And when done as well as it can, it really just feels like good music teaching. So just the, the key points is that it has to be embedded in music in our case. We're not counselors and that it needs to be intentional are the big three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, one of the reactions that I'm seeing right now, maybe this is just reactionary on social media is the idea that, you know, we're, you know, we're not, this isn't what we're doing. We should be making good music. We should be focusing on the music. And um, I don't know if you want to address that idea or not. I'd love to, I'd love to. So it's not an either, or when we have our students being self-aware and are reflecting in on the music, and they are able to understand their frame of mind and to understand how to navigate stress and intense emotion, the music gets better. You know, social emotional learning is not, is not, is not a mechanism for classroom management. I hate the term classroom management. We don't manage kids. We're together in a process and we're working together through relationships. But when we have these skills of social awareness and self-awareness, Behavior challenges aren't even on the books. It just doesn't happen because they're making good decisions and we understand the path that we're on. So for me, it's not an either or. In fact, SEL makes the music better. And if people are concerned about time, which is, we all wish we had more time with our kids, I totally get it. I'll tell you that SEL sometimes takes a little bit more time on the front end but so does learning scales, but so does learning procedures on how to practice. If we can build these skills on the front end, the students are going to be more independent, more autonomous, more devoted, and have more buy-in to our processes so that we can have a better musical product. Forever, better is pretty subjective though. What I am seeing uh, in the work that I'm doing with uh, bands at all levels, uh, ensembles at all levels, music students at all levels, is that when these teachers are doing SEL and doing it well, not only does the music get better, but I see more joy in the classroom. I see more fulfillment. I see more curiosity. The, the, the attitudes and the affect in these classrooms 
is so relaxed and it is just we're exploring. And, and why is that? Because the kids feel safe. No one is going to be willing to take a risk unless they feel safe. And music making is a risk. We demand vulnerability. We demand that you put yourself out there. So if our kids feel safe, they're going to make better music. You're, they're going to put themselves out there and they're going to feel free to collaborate with their peers. And, you know, I, I'm going to say something here that might be a little controversial, but I'm not a huge fan of the virtual ensembles. Um, I understand their value. I understand why it's necessary for us to engage in this, especially during the pandemic. But that's not a full menu of music education. That can be an appetizer, but that's not what our students got into music for. That's not what they joined band for. They joined band to play their instruments with other people, not record on their own and have us play grandmaster on the other side to be able to uh, uh, put piece everything together. That's not what. Uh, that's not why our students got into band. That's not why we got in to band. Um, so, you know, this all gets me to think about, you know, one, what is our definition of good music and good uh, and a good performance? And two, why do some of these skills get in the way of this? Because in the end, my experience is it actually makes it better. So you've talked a lot about the skills and the, and the um, you know, the, the values or the value of SEL and, and what it means to us as music educators. Can we kind of maybe do the, break this down by my grade level and work our way up on some, some nuts and bolts ideas that maybe might illustrate what you're trying to do or what you're trying to talk about here. So like, for example, how would we um, integrate SEL concepts into our beginning band, our youngest students? Yeah, it, it's great. So, um, you know, there are two ways, especially in band that I see that we could approach um, SEL. One is through the repertoire and the other is through the experience. And I firmly believe that once we get to a critical level that the repertoire needs to be guiding, that we need to program music with heart that's going to connect with our students. But Sometimes it's a little hard to find heart in hot cross buns, right? Uh, th that's not the, the easiest entry point. So uh, I recommend uh, the, the ground level for any SEL curriculum, any musical SEL curriculum needs to be emotional vocabulary building. <clears throat> Our students' emotional vocabulary usually stops at happy, sad, fine. We need to give them tools, words, ways to express music and themselves beyond that. So um, I highly recommend from the very beginning, giving, their, giving your students opportunities for voice and choice. What that means for beginning band is starting to allow them to set their own goals, <clears throat> give them the opportunity to say, this is what I want out of this experience. This is you know, give them a choice of four exercises. Don't make them do the whole page of every method, but give them the choice to choose one or two exercises and do it well. And then thoughtfully say, this is my goal <clears throat> in doing this. I think a lot of students, especially at the youngest level, don't understand how to practice. They do what they do well. They practice what they can already do and perform. They're afraid to tackle the, the real challenges. So a big goal, especially for our youngest students, is to make them self-aware of their strengths and their needs. What are you doing well? What are you bringing to the table? And what do you need to improve on? <clears throat> this brings up the second point. So once we get students to set their own goals, then we can have students self-assess. Because I firmly believe that students, us, we all, either have an overinflated sense of self or an underinflated sense of self. Very few of us actually have an accurate self-perception of where we hit on a multitude of areas. Often both at the same time, I find. <laughs> it's amazing, right? <laughs> and it changes on a daily basis sometimes, depending on where what we're doing. Um, but to help students say, so you think you're here. Well, I'm going to say that you're here. Let's dialogue about it. Let's talk about it. You know, I, I think that the biggest challenge that I'm facing right now in my own teaching, Mark, is to redefine what high expectation is, because the pandemic has pretty much destroyed uh, what I've traditionally had as that really high bar for myself and for my students. So, one of the challenges that I'm having on a daily basis is to take a step back and say, 
okay, let's let the kids help redefine what that bar is. And I think that is one of the most important things that we can do, especially at the young level. So, you know, what I talked about so far at the young level is very performance based, but this fall, we're going to have to explore extra performance elements to get them to respond, create and connect. So when I look at it from that angle, I think my primary job this fall is to one, remind students that they love music, to be able to connect the music that the students are listening to outside of school with the music that I want to teach them in school. And how does that deck fold together? And when I do that, then I'm able to reach the students, to remind the students that they love music and to teach them how to deepen that love. Because let's face it, right now, our biggest job is to get our students to be connected, to understand music. You know, my mantra right now, Mark, that I've been saying uh, pretty much every time that I have an opportunity to talk to someone is this fall needs before notes. We have to tackle our students' social and emotional needs before we have any hope of having meaningful musical teaching and learning. Now is not the time to say, oh, I want to get my beginners to learn another scale, or I want to take my wind ensemble from grade four to grade five rep. Not this fall. That's It's not the right time for that. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the mental capability. We don't have the emotional stability as an educational system and as, uh, as us. I'm not there. Our, my students aren't there. We need to take a step back and give our students space to navigate their social and emotional needs. And we'll get to the other stuff. We'll get back to that. But now is not the time. Well, yeah, you have to take the long view right now. We're, we can rebuild everything. Right now, it's it's just keeping, you know, trying to maintain what we have and maintaining these kids and they're, they're you know, being there for them. Because ultimately, I was going to always be a teacher. Music just happened to be what I'm teaching. Spot on. And, you know, I often say that, you know, if I were going to be a science teacher, I would probably be a poor science teacher. Not that I can't understand the material and not that I can't cohesively piece together instruction. I don't love science. I love that people love science, but that's not my passion to do as a career. We need fabulous scientists, but wow, we would be up the creek if that were my job right now. But um, music is where it is for me. And, you know, I often say, you know, I, I've been accused um when I am very passionate about something, about someone telling me that, you know what, Scott, you're really enthused about this, but this isn't number one on our list right now. And almost saying that critically. And I, I've been building up the courage to say this. And I, I, I found a space where I knew this would be receptive. And I said, you know what? Our goal in life needs to have everyone be as passionate as they can be so that they think that what they're bringing to the table is the most important thing in the world. It might not be the most important thing in your world, but I want every kid to come to me thinking that what they have and what they are bringing to the table is their most important thing. Otherwise, no one's bringing their A game. But that's hard when we have so many of those conflicts. That's where SEL, I found, uh, can give us some skills. So that's that goal one of self. So as we're starting, you know, back to your original question of how do we sequence this up, once we have those foundational skills, we get through self. We get our students to understand that how they're feeling. And, and you know, our kids love to talk about themselves. <laughs> you know, that, that they, they're developmentally hardwired to be centric at this point. As they grow and start to hone that skill, then we can start to say, okay, you have something that you think is the most important thing in the world. You have something that you think is most important in the world. Now we introduce the word empathy. How can we get us to empathize with each other so that we can have a cohesive product and come together and do something really, really special? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things you said in a lecture I heard of yours was the idea of um, Maslow before Bloom. That's kind of where we're at. Absolutely, Maslow before Bloom. So Maslow is the hierarchy of human needs. Blues, uh, Bloom's is the uh, higher order thinking. And you know, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy, we are 100% living in those bottom basic needs of food, air, water. The second level up from that is safety, and no one's getting out of safety needs right now. That means that the top whole portion of Maslow, of reaching our true selves, 
is not even on the table. And I would argue that Bloom's fits very cleanly on top of Maslow. So if we can't get through Maslow, we have no chance of really pushing our brains. To further that, we're all in trauma right now. We are in a universal trauma. We're all experiencing stress. We're all experiencing anxiety. And when we look at that, the human brain is unable to function in the way that a non-traumatized brain can. The students aren't going to be learning the same way. We're not going to be teaching the same way. For us to truly be able to get back to a place that we can optimize teaching and learning, we have to adopt this Maslow before Bloom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to stick with the, the nuts and bolts thing, because I want to try to reach everyone who's listening here. How about the middle grades? What, what are we looking for for SEL for the middle grades in our bands? Yeah, and those middle grades, you know, middle school is one of those really, really tough times. And you either absolutely love middle school students, or that is like, oh, thank goodness you like middle school, because that's not my cup of tea. Totally get it. But what those students need is a space to tinker, a space to discover, a space to explore. And this is where safe space is one of the most essential elements of social and emotional learning. So I think when you say, you know, what are, would be the skill sets that I would really want to hone in the middle school level, this is when I'm going to start to uh, really stress responsible decision-making. So what decisions are you making on a day-to-day life? And that can be in your, uh, your personal life, that can be in your relationships, or that can be musically. You know, we've understood now, how do we establish a, a good tone quality? How do we establish, how do we approach our instrument? How do we sight read? How do we understand those things? But when we start to get to middle school, we can start to, and, and I would argue that we can do this at the younger grades too, but at middle school, we can really start to give autonomy to the students to make musical decisions, to say, how, where should this phrase go? Should we change the dynamics? Is there a stress here? What should, uh, if you could change the articulation, how would you do it? Things like that. This is where we can start to really get the students to explore. You know, something really, really interesting happens on the first day with the beginning band student. You give them a shiny instrument or that beautiful clarinet and you say, here it is. I want you just to explore and make sounds for five seconds. Stop. And then we build so many walls around the kids and we take all of the tinkering out of the game. And we really don't give them an opportunity to ever get back to it. Middle school, once we've taught all of our good habits and they know how to navigate their instruments and they're pretty comfortable with this puppy, this is when we're able to say, we need to get back to that exploring. Just pause there and say, I never think we should leave that exploration, but we know that that's often what it looks like. Middle school, though, we need to do that. So middle school is also the time when I think that students can have choice uh, and not that they can't always, but they can choose repertoire. The chamber groups really work well at this point, uh, getting them to understand what, um, what their strengths and what their needs are and understanding at this point the importance of music after middle school. I think it's never too early to start to show them uh, next steps, not finish lines, but next steps and show them the direction where things could go. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And now how about the high school director? Yeah. So the high school director, this is really where we can start become a facilitator. So when we start to look at things as a facilitator and less as a director, uh, and that's kind of what, you know, Mark, you and I were talking before we pressed record today that, you know, I feel like I'm a really good facilitative teacher when I uh, have my students sight read and through maybe the first five weeks. But that week before the concert, I become a director. And it's you, it, how can I shove those notes down your throat for that last push? <clears throat> but you know what? When we start to look at the high school level, this is where we really need to start to take a step back. And the best high school directors get this, that if they can give ownership and autonomy and leadership, and not as a role, but as an attitude in leadership, our students can start to learn what it means to have control over their musical education and to really be able to start to see what music means in their lives. So I think this is a place that we can start to really expand their musicianship in a lot of different directions. 
we can expand it in terms of composition, in terms of our making arrangements, in terms of service. Um, you know, I, I think in high school, uh, it, we would be uh, missing a huge opportunity if we didn't have our students interacting with each other uh, and developing double-sided arrows. I mean, this fall when we're, many of us are virtual, I, I think that we need students to help us. We need students to help us do our job. And at your service is really one of the most important things we can adopt. And it can't be the, the student relationships. It can't be, okay, senior, you're going to be teaching the freshman. No, that's not what this looks like. We need to be able to develop relationships where the only way that students feel fulfilled and safe is if they have something to offer. If it's just the senior doing something to the freshman, well, that the, the freshman's not offering anything. The freshman needs to have an active role in this process so that the double-sided arrow is being created. So this is the point. <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I actually have a huge complaint uh, about where SEL is living right now, and it pretty much stops in 12th grade uh, in terms of uh, the discussion and in terms of what materials are out there. So from that perspective, I mean, SEL, when we, we hit high school um, and we hit that musical high school level, it, it's not the finish line, but that, that's a place that we, we've sort of stopped the discussion. Now, I firmly believe that SEL needs to travel with students into college. That's the first time that they're starting to explore adulthood. They need SEL there now more than ever. Um, but the, um, you, you know, I think when we're starting to navigate what it looks like in high school band, it really does come down to give, start pulling that safety net away and start to say, you know what? I'm not going to be here next year. What's music going to look like in your life? Yeah. So how about that, that next level? I do have a few college directors who tune in. What about for them? You know, I think the easiest way for me to, tell you about that is to tell you what I'm going to do this fall. Uh, because it, this was one of my biggest challenges because I, I talk a lot about this, Mark, and I, I go and I, I tell people what my thoughts are about SEL and ways to give voice and choice. And then this fall, I was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to get my students to perform? And I, I, was, I was doing everything. I, I was not walking the walk that I was talking. <clears throat> So it was leading me to a really bad place. It was leading me to a place of focusing on what I can't do and really going into that hole as opposed to focusing on what I can do. So this fall at Lake Forest College, I am developing strands for our concert band system. And the students are going to get to choose how they engage with concert band. We're 100% virtual. We have no concerts. That's the reality. Those are the cards. So what's this going to look like? There are four strands. We meet for four hours a week. Every strand gets one hour. The students get to select into at least two. So they have to engage with me in at least two hours a week. <clears throat> one strand is going to be performance, where the students are able to start talking to each other about maybe doing a Flipgrid video, working on a piece of music that we're going to eventually prepare for a concert. And the students are going to all have the score, and they're going to be able to start to have more ownership about preparing the music and they're going to be able to work together. I'll be there to facilitate, but it is not going to be me fixing notes and rhythms. That is not the goal of this strand. The second goal, uh, the second strand is going to be service. So I talked about the importance of service in high school. Well, in college, it's no different. And I'm going to encourage my students to reach out to their middle school and high school directors and say, what do you need? Put me in. Let me help you. Let me make a video of how to put my flute together. Let me do a sectional with your tenor saxophones. Let me help you. And that could be, you know, putting something into finale. That could be making a poster for something that could be putting together something. The needs are driven by the directors and whatever they need. Our students are going to be there to provide support. <clears throat> the third strand is going to be advocacy. We know right now that we are entering into a period where we need to advocate for music in a new and unique and essential way. So we're going to come together and talk about what advocacy in music education and in the band world can look like. 
and we're going to put together an advocacy packet, an advocacy movement. I don't know what it's going to look like. So I say packet, I say movement. I don't know. The kids are going to drive it. it. It's whatever they want out of that experience. I'm going to be there to facilitate it, but it's their game. And then the third thing, the, excuse me, the fourth, uh, the fourth strand, and this is the one I'm excited about more than anything, I think, is that uh, all the students will be involved in this fourth strand. They get to choose two out of the four, but everyone will be in this one. This is composition. And the students aren't going to compose directly. The students, you know, I don't have to buy any music this fall, right? I'm not going to put on any concerts. I don't have to rent a hall. So I have a little bit of capital. And what am I going to do? I'm going to hire a composer in residence. And it's not going to be the traditional composer in residence who gives us music to perform. It's actually Kevin Day. Um, and Kevin's going to work with us uh, on a regular basis. My students are going to fill out Google Forms that's going to self-assess their levels, saying, I'm good at this. I want to get better at this. Here's my range. Here's my comfortability with multiple tonguing. And we're going to send that to Kevin. Kevin's going to zoom into our classes. He's going to dialogue with us. He's going to put together a piece of music that is going to push us 2% above where the students think that they are, their own self-awareness of their strengths and needs. The students are going to be in on discussing about what social justice element they want to put into the piece, dialogue and collaborate on the title. And we're going to be going back and forth with Kevin over the entire semester. As far as I know, this is going to result in the first 100% socially and emotionally um, collaborative piece of music ever. Uh, and Kevin has just been fabulous of saying, I'm all in. You tell me what you want. His humility is inspiring and the students are just going to be able to have access to Kevin. So I, uh, so that's what it's going to look like this fall. Um, when we get back to some semblance of reality, um, what this means, I think, is exactly what those four core values need to be, is that performance is important for us, of course, but there can be something else, and that can be service. That can be composition and understanding the broader world of music outside of our lives, and it can be advocacy, because I think one of the most important things that we can teach our students you know, many students are not going to continue into music after college, depending on where we teach, that might be a different answer. But we can teach lifelong advocates. We can teach lifelong lovers. We need people to go out and say the arts are important. And that can be something that we can teach in college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for that. I mean, that was really great to kind of kind of go through each level, because I think, you know, when I listen to you and, you know, it's all great, but it's like, I really want to know what I can actually do. You know, I think that's when you can sort of take the ideas and really get them. Thank you for pushing me on that. I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to unpack. You know, a lot of times when I'm talking, I have an hour and I feel like I'm talking a mile a minute mm -hmm. just to get through the nuts and bolts. Sure. And, you know, the nuts and bolts are necessary, but then what does it look like at each level and what skills might we build sequentially? Um, I, there, there are some things I can tell you that are in the works and there are some things that unfortunately I can't pull the curtain back quite yet. But um, I, what I will say is that we are working with, uh, on a number of projects that are going to more explicitly put social and emotional learning into the compositions uh, where you're, there's going to be pieces of music out there that at different levels, it's going to be adapted to say, here's how you can engage with social and emotional learning on this piece of music. Uh, and that's one of the objectives of the, of the uh, teaching social and emotional learning through music and talking through these composers to say, you know, here's a piece of music. How can we do SEL through that? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we're, we're starting to build in that direction. Uh, but I, I, I think the other reason Mark is that we still have so many people who are still wrapping their heads around what is SEL. Uh, so for me, uh, my brain thinks big to small, but many people do like to think small to big. So thank you for getting us to have both of those conversations. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting to me because as a composer also, I, you know, the, the social emotional piece is really a big part of what I'm doing when I'm writing a piece of music. I don't just write, you know, a fugue because it's an exercise or I don't write a band piece because it's an exercise. I write it because there's some emotion that I want to kind of convey through it. Certainly. And, you know, um, we're still we're we're just at the preliminary point of talking about this, but I think our best composers, 
I think our best composers do exactly what you just said. Um, I had the privilege, Alex, uh, Alex Shapiro was one of my first guests on this series. And she said, you know, music is a portal. When we do social and emotional learning in our classrooms, music is a portal into our hearts and out to the world around us. And music is central to that. Uh, I'll give a, a little bit of a spoiler here. One of um, my next guests on the show is going to be Jim Stevenson. Uh, and Jim is just a master of coding his music. Every single note that he puts into his work is emotionally coded. And it has some meaning outside of a black and white dot. You know, we, we told, tell our students all the time. You know, this is just, we're, we're just, we, we're just decoding notes and rhythms. No, when we start to unpack the social and emotional learning side of things, then we are able to say, what is the meaning? What is the emotion? You know, I use the example often that one of my favorite pieces, favorites, the wrong word, most meaningful pieces of music in my life is Mahler's second symphony. It's a story of resurrection. It's a story of redefinition. It's a story of journey. And if you were to say to me, Scott, how does this make you feel? And I say, fine, doesn't cut it. I need to be able to have a background to understand the story, to understand what the composer intended for these notes. So <clears throat> that's part of what we're starting to look at, Mark, is to say, you know, let's look at this piece of music. Let's look at Jim's second symphony and let's start to unpack these movements and say, what was in your heart? How do you want our students to engage with this music? And <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, I had the pleasure also of interviewing Brian Balmages. And <clears throat> when he talks about it, this is so important because he says that this can be accessible to even our youngest students because our students at, at any level, <clears throat> fourth, fifth grade, are undergoing so much emotional distress. They're ready to talk about these challenges. <clears throat> They need to have an opportunity to engage with music that's worthy of this type of discussion. They're ready for it. We just need to find the music. So, you know, when people say, you know, how do I go and find music? The answer is you just need to look a little harder. There is music out there that has heart. And let's face it, there's music out there that doesn't. <clears throat> and we can, uh, when, when I pick music for my ensemble, you better believe that it doesn't just check boxes of range, instrumentation. That's in there, but then there's another box of how is this going to uh, connect to my kids' lives? Yeah, it's often described by composers as musical honesty. Like, is your music honest? Or, you know, because I, I know when I write a piece of music, whether it feels authentic to me, because they don't always, even if I'm trying to be authentic. Does that make sense? Perfect sense. And there's Absolutely. some there's some pieces that I write that really feel more honest than others. And I don't know I don't know the subtleties of the psychology of that, but um I definitely know what you're saying. And and those pieces tend to speak and do better, honestly, than others. And you, you know, I'm not a composer. That's not my world. So I appreciate your ability to speak to this, but um what what I'm loving about having these discussions with these composers is that knowing that it's intentional, <clears throat> that it's in their heart, and that it's manifesting in the works. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple things that I uh, need to tie up here before we finish. And um, one thing that you and I briefly touched on a little bit is we are in um, a summer of great change in our country. And with the pandemic and with the George Floyd um, killing in Minneapolis, we've had um, a lot of discussions on race and how we can have culturally inclusive classrooms and how we can address issues and be anti-racists. And I know that social emotional learning has, has a role to play in this discussion as well. It certainly does, Mark. And thank you for, for asking that question. Uh, I certainly have a lot of thoughts on this. The biggest thing that I think we need to acknowledge is first that if social and emotional learning is misused and there have been some discussions about how SEL can be misused, it could be used as another element of control. And that's the last thing we want. But if we think about it, if I were to say, oh, Mark, just self-manage, that emotion doesn't make sense. Come on, suck it up. You should be happy. Well, that's counter to everything that I've said so far, counter to everything that is valuable for social and emotional learning. When we say every emotion is validated, 
every emotion is has a place and you can be disgusted and you can be afraid and you can be angry. Okay. Now we have a starting place to have these conversations. Social and emotional learning can be used and I would argue should be used as a lever for anti-racism. <clears throat> now we have a gift. We have a gift that music can be our portal, as Alex Shapiro would say. Music can be our entry point. A lot of times the directors that I'm talking with, they say, oh, Scott, I know this is important. I should be having these conversations. I just don't know how to do it. And I'm going to tie this back into music in just a second. But I'm going to start by talking about Mr. Rogers, that in 1969, Mr. Rogers said, I'm going to take a stance on racism. But he didn't come out and say, let's talk about racism. He put his feet into a kiddie pool with a black man in 1969. And that's how he said racism is wrong. <clears throat> we can do the same thing with music by putting music out there that represents diverse composers, that represents diversity, inclusion, and equity, and truly shows our students that it is not all by composers that I'm a white male that look like me. We need to get beyond that point so that we are able to show our students what diversity looks like and the power of music to tell a story and to advocate. <clears throat> you know, we just lost John Lewis um, and the great civil rights uh, activist, and he's famed for saying that the civil rights movement without music would have been like a bird without wings. And when we think about it like that, <clears throat> our job through music to address racism is to teach our students what is the bird and what are the wings? You know, we, we can use those as entry points and we can Mr. Rogers that down to our smallest smallies and we can have these conversations. I know that many of us are uncomfortable reaching these topics, but we need to have the courage to, because the students are having these conversations outside of your classroom. If we can show them through music, how we can truly embrace equity and love and empathy and diversity and all those things that SEL prizes then we're getting someplace. Then we're going to at least show our students our values and giving them an opportunity to say, this is where I know that I can belong. So Scott, there's two other things I want to talk about here. Um, the one thing that comes up a lot and you brought it up a lot is that we're in a time of sustained trauma. Um, you know, sustained stress is causing trauma for all of us. I don't know if I put that correctly. And you talked about the idea of safety and something that's been a recurring theme over the four years I've done this show is, you know, most of my guests recall the band room, recall the band as a place of safety when they were in school. Um, what is it? What, what is the, what are the intangible things you think that we do as band directors that create that sense of safety? And is there anything we can do to enhance that even further? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I'm actually going to take it from a slightly different angle, Mark, because I do believe we can do things to enhance it. Uh, and I do believe there are things that are inherent and, and it, it comes down to everything from developmental relationships. We see these kids to developmental experiences. We're experiencing and bringing together. So we're working through challenges. Uh, we're bringing together our students around a common theme, love of music. But I really do believe that when we say music classrooms are a safe space, that they are not safe for all, they are safe for some. And oftentimes they are safe for our most involved and maybe our highest performing students. <clears throat> that we really need to take a good look at our classrooms and see if it really is safe for that last chair trumpet player. Is it really safe for the student who comes in right before rehearsal, sits down, probably isn't overly comfortable being vulnerable, uh, and we know there's no room to hide in band. So is it safe for that student? So what can we do? We need to look at all of our students and really hold ourselves to a higher standards of 
safe space for some or safe space for all. I love that you say that because, you know, it's so easy to focus on just the top achievers, you know, and, and again, I, I said most of my guests, but most of my guests are professional musicians, accomplished band directors, accomplished composers. And so sometimes I'm glad that you said that, that, you know, it's not just that group we're talking to. It needs to be. Yeah. And, you know, l- let's face it, it, it really does come down to social capital. And, you know, I, I think probably every band director in the history of the world has been accused of playing favorites. And what does favorites come down to? Well, I would argue that some of it has to do with social capital. The kids who are our air quote favorites are the ones who have buy-in, who work hard on what we want them to work hard in, who show a vested interest in something that we love. Every single one of those things is building social capital with us. They're the first to sit down. They're the first to be ready. Social capital, social capital. They're the first one to say, hey, I love this piece of music, even if they really don't love it. Every single one of those things is building social capital, which can lead to it to be very easy to fall into this favorite trap. So they're building the relationship with us. It makes sense. That's what we need to fight, not to ignore those hardcore band students, because we need to nourish them and foster their love to an even deeper level. But it's very, very easy to just look at that top level and ignore everyone else. Yeah, that's really good advice. That's really excellent advice. It makes me think of a band parent and a confrontation I had while I was a band director. That was one of my lowest moments as a high school band director, but which leads me to my next question about parents, because a lot of us are seeing our numbers go way down. And I know that, um, my numbers are way down and I'm going to make some videos this weekend talking to parents about what I'm going to do to, to, you know, for the band and to help their kids feel safe and make their kids safe. And so can we talk a little bit about the relationships we build with parents? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the big things that I'm suggesting that all music educators do this fall is to start to ask students what they love about music education. What do they love about music? What did they miss when they weren't having it, if we're still not having it in the way that we're used to, what are they longing for? What are they thirsting for? When we start to get those arguments from our students, then it's low lying fruit to get mama bear and papa bear on board, right? They, the parents almost always are going to be there to support their students. And when they perceive that their students aren't getting what they need, that's when the fangs come out. Very rarely do we have really vindictive parents to who want to really attack anything. They just want what's best for their kids. And when their kid doesn't get a solo or whatnot, that's when the fangs come out. <clears throat> so, you know, I love your idea, Mark, about reaching out to this, the parents because it really does begin and end with communication. And this fall, I firmly believe that there is no such thing as over communicating. We need to communicate in as many different modalities as we can. But th- there's a piece that I think many people are missing right now that if we need to make a case, if we need to be there front and center and say, this is the value of the arts, the parents need to be there with us. It cannot be us versus the parents. And if we have parents who are also administrators or school board members, now is the time to reach out to them and say, you know what? I'm just curious. What does music education mean to you? What does music education at Lake Forest College mean to you? What does it mean to you at your high school? And let's start to curate those because the power of parents to see positive role models out there that says, this is what music means to me. And I guarantee you, the answers are always going to go back to what it means to the kids, but we need to develop a two-sided arrow. So yes, we need to communicate and send all the information to the parents but we need to have open avenues for them to communicate to us. And they're going to be frustrated this fall. They're going to be frustrated this fall because their kids are going to be frustrated this fall. And we're frustrated this fall. It's going to be a lot of frustration. So the more that we can communicate and we can really be proactive about saying what our intentions are and what we want from our students and how can we engage the parents in the process. And even if we give the parents a flip grid and say, just spend 30 seconds and tell me about what you love about music. That's giving us a powerful, powerful support for why our programs matter. 
Yeah, absolutely, Scott. This has really been great. So I just want to kind of follow up here. You have a book, um, you mentioned it earlier, but it's Music Education and Social Emotional Learning, The Heart of Teaching Music. Um, and so you have that. That's a, um, There's a, a textbook and a workbook. I imagine it's used in some courses. Yeah, you, you know, um, it's not as it's not as prescriptive as I think the titles might evoke. Uh, everything in there needs to be adapted for your setting, and everything needs to be figured out how you can make it organic. Uh, the the book um, textbook um, I, I don't really like to call that. It, it's 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 an easy read. It's a summer read. That was my goal was to make it accessible for teachers to really see themselves implementing this organically into the classroom. In the workbook is nothing more than having a formal way of visualizing what these activities could look like. I see. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it gives the teacher an opportunity to say, what could a reflection question look like? What could it look like if I were to use this as an exit slip? In today's society, what would it look like as a Google form? What would it look like in remote learning? Okay. My goal was to give resources that are not prescriptive, but that are easily adaptable so that teachers can start to play with these things in a way that really does look musical. So Scott, I know you also have some articles that are written, but I want to ask, is there, um, is there a good bibliography or review of literature that people can kind of look further, look, sort of do their own research into this, these ideas? Yeah. So, um, To dig more into social emotional learning, there's a couple of places that I would recommend starting. And I'm going to take it in order of practitioner, inspirational, all the way up to heavy duty research. The first place that I would recommend you go is Edutopia. Uh, That's George Lucas's educational foundation. And social emotional learning is just dripping. Uh, The force is strong with SEL and George Lucas's education. Uh, Edutopia work. And I would suggest looking there because those are some really good, practical, really, really quick get in, get out. From there, I would suggest taking a look at the Music for All new SEL page that we're we're working on, because this is a place that uh, we're really trying to use as a clearinghouse, where you're going to be able to see all this information. It's all free. You're going to be able to engage and see all the videos with the composers that I've been talking about. There's also a Facebook page that I've created that is literally just the dumping ground for whenever I find anything that relates to SEL and music. Uh, And if you were just to search for music education uh, and social and emotional learning on uh, Facebook, it'll pop on up. Uh, And then all the way up to a group called CASEL, C-A-S-E-L dot O-R-G, stands for the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning. And they are our thought leaders, our research leaders, and our policy leaders in terms of SEL. That's not in music or the arts, but they are really, uh, if you're looking for arguments for district folks or your administrators, Castle's the place that I would go for that. Remember your first term of teaching? Learning all the skills that you don't get taught in music school? Managing a transitioning culture in your classroom? Finding out that you have to teach guitar this term? During those early years, we found out that leaning on a community of music educators was important, not only for building that knowledge in ourselves, but also maintaining enough sanity to serve the students right in front of us. Amused is a podcast centered around a community of music teachers. Between the four of us, we teach choir, band, orchestra, general, jazz, and marching band at the elementary through collegiate levels. We certainly don't have all the answers, but you're welcome to listen in while we try to find them. Join us while we work through the challenges of music teaching and celebrate the joy of bringing music making into the lives of young people. In each episode, you'll hear stories, both good and bad, about that week of teaching, and we'll try and tackle an issue that one of us is struggling with. Something we're all taught is that music brings people together, but being the only teacher in your subject at a site can be really isolating. We think everyone ought to be a part of a community, and you're welcome to come join ours. Episodes come out on Wednesdays during the school year, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts and at amusedcast.org. Excellent, Scott. This has been really great. I really appreciate you talking on these topics. Now I want to do our final questions here, if that's okay with you. Let's go. So these are the questions I ask everyone, regardless of what they do in the band world. (laughs) Yep. The first of these is right in your lane. (laughs) Where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Ah, great question. Um, th- there is no line. Um, the line is a very, very dotted line, and it's dictated by what motivates the students, because I think competition at its heart 
is only as valuable as it is for the student to create their own goals. Um, I firmly believe that music largely is too competitive, uh, but some students need competition. So for me, the answer is as varied and as individual as the number of students who I have in front of me. All right, Scott, this is a difficult question. A lot of band directors take great pride in their work ethic and being the the first car in and the last car out. But how do you find a work-life balance in a career as a music teacher? (laughs) Uh, Ask my wife that. Uh, (laughs) Over the last few months, I don't think balance has been something that I've been really successful at. Um, And, you know, I I do believe technology and smartphones have really kind of hurt our ability to have balance. for me, I think, and, and this is my go-to language that I tell other people that I need to learn myself, um, is that we need to have something more important in our life than our job. If our sole identity is that of a band director or as a music teacher, we are in danger of burnout. We are in danger of not being our best for ourselves or our students. So whether it be family or a significant other or cooking or travel or sports or cheering on your local sports team, which I'm just starving for, uh, that, you know, whatever that looks like, it needs to be more important than your job. It needs to be. Otherwise, we're not going to have balance ever. All right. So pandemic aside, um, because that's obvious right now, that's the low hanging fruit. What are the challenges facing music education and band and how can we best meet them? Yeah. And I think it really gets down to this challenge of cultural relevance or cultural responsivity is how do we balance the musical lives of our students outside of our classroom with the musical lives of our students in our classroom. And it's not an either or. It's not saying jettison our goal as band directors and just totally go in and say, oh, what do you want to play? Okay, let's do the new music from Frozen. No, no, that's not the game we're playing here. But we need to do a better job of looking at the musical lives of our students outside to restructure, to reinvent, to reimagine, to dream about how those worlds can collide in a more authentic way. And there are some powerful composers out there who are doing this at a really high level now. So the work is being done. Our goal needs to be to find that music and figure out how that resonates with our students and not assume that some of the things that we're talking about are going to resonate with our students. That becomes culturally assumptive, not culturally responsive. So we need to have discussions with our students and say, what are you looking out of this experience? What type of music do you want? What type of sounds intrigue you? And send them on scavenger hunts to learn more about repertoire. Engage them with the composers. You know, if this, you know, I I know you said pandemic aside, but one thing that the pandemic has done is I'm seeing composers come into the classroom at a much higher level. This is a call to service for them. So please, engaging them in these conversations, it's a huge step forward. All right, Scott. So I have just invented a time machine, and I take you back to the afternoon of your high school graduation. What are you telling yourself? Oh, wow. You know, I I think that for me, it comes down to as easily as I can say this, that it begins and ends with relationships that we've talked about social capital. We've talked about social emotional learning. We've talked a little bit about mindfulness. We didn't call it that. Those are buzzwords. What does it come and what does it look like in our world? It comes down to relationships that kids aren't going to do anything for us if we don't have a relationship with them. This fall, my mantra that I am trying to embrace is from trauma to trust through music. And that starts and ends with a relationship. So the best life advice I can have, and Mark, you and I were talking about this at the beginning, that our profession is too small. And that's a beautiful thing that we need to build as many relationships with as many different people as possible. All right. So this is, um, you may have already mentioned it. I think you did. But Scott, if you um, had a chance to conduct one final work, what would it be? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's a big one. Uh, you know, what, what's interesting about my relationship with repertoire 
is that it's constantly changing. And I find myself very, very cyclical and, and moving on. And I know that, you know, if, if I were to say, if I knew you were going to ask this question, I was like, okay, give me, give me the, uh, give me the spread, give me the spray chart and, and let's see. So I, I'm not going to hit anything that's probably new or novel, but I'm going to tell you the piece of music that made me fall in love with band repertoire. And that's going to be my answer for this. Um, when I was a junior in high school, I had the opportunity to be in my first honor band at Bowling Green State University under the baton of Colonel Arnold Gabriel. And the piece of music that he put in front of us that made us all just say, wow, was Robert W. Smith's Inferno. And that was the piece of music that traveled with me through every single chapter of my band directing life. That was the first time I performed it. It came back with me to high school. I performed it twice in college, played with it when I was directing bands, and it's traveled with me. So, you know, is that my favorite piece? Probably not. It's up there. I really th think the musical value there is, is powerful. But that's the piece that the things that come with us through chapters of our life come with us for a reason. And that one's always been there. So I'm going to say that one. Scott, I know you mentioned the the Music for All website. We should probably touch on that one more time. But is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Yeah. So there's going to be a few things that are coming out that I think are really going to be um, be helpful for our teachers. The Music for All website, um, I'm so excited with the collaboration that we're doing. And, and they, they've had so much positive energy to say social emotional learning needs to be out there. And as Bands of America and things have necessarily been canceled, they're taking some great resources and saying, let's put this front and center. So the website's going to be huge. I'll just tell you some of our future guests that we're going to see. Uh, Omar Thomas is going to be a guest uh, on this uh, coming up. Jim Stevenson. Um, we are in the talks of having some really big heavy hitters at all level. Uh, so we're really, really excited about what's going to be coming out of there, but also just that page is going to be where we're going to have a lot of resources and they have the infrastructure to be able to support it. Um, there is a new book that's going to be coming out <clears throat> that I am editing. It is so not my voice, but I've had the privilege of working with so many teachers who are the pioneers in musical, social, and emotional learning. And they are writing chapters for this about what it looks like in their settings, about what activities they are doing, about what pieces they are using as portals for social and emotional learning. And so I think this book is going to be the, the new definition of the how. How does this manifest in our classroom? So we're hoping that that's going to get out uh, mid-2021. Uh, All right, Scott, how can people get in touch with you? The easiest way, I am an emailaholic. So please email me at edgar at lakeforest.edu. And I promise you, you'll get a response. Uh, there's an entry point for you to send me an email via the Music for All website. Uh, you can find me on the GIA publications website, but just shoot me an email directly through the college and I'll help in any way that I can. Yeah, I have to, I have to say that you're right. You are very responsive to email. It, <laughs> Impressively so. Quick and quick and get it out to you. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Scott, thanks so much for this. This was a terrific conversation. Oh, Mark. Thank you. It's been my honor. Mm -hmm.